Hey everyone and welcome back to the news. Patch 8.2.5 PTR is here. There are loads of really cool bits of lore, plus new models including the new Goblin and Worgen revamp, so we have a lot to talk about. And then also, we are hiring. It's a writing position for our industry news channel, so you can check out the link below for that. And a big thank you to the patrons who've made that possible and helped us grow. We're actually working on a special WoW project very soon, and if you'd like to help us out, well, it does happen to be Pals and Month over on our Patreon, so you'll get your two bits of art and the vinyl sticker all for 25 bucks, shipping included. So, with that covered, Let's get into today's very exciting news. Okay, Raffian is back. Well, somewhat. So, Patch 8.2.5 seemingly is going to be advancing the Champions of Azeroth storyline. Predictably, it's the Champions of Azeroth, though things uh, aren't exactly going that well because, hey, we're quite easily played. Seemingly, we are rushed into the Chamber of the Heart where we find that Spiritwalker Ebonhorn is dealing with Old God Corruption. Now, that's alarming because he is, well, inside the Chamber of the Heart, but that's not exactly a new thing. The Chamber of the Heart has had a few void incursions before. Mother seemingly attempts to sanitize Ebonhorn, which does make sense given her pretty much being a robot, but Magni is able to call her off. Now, Magni seemingly knows that Rathian has been up to something, and that Rathian's knowledge could be vital to saving Ebonhorn and Azeroth. So he says that it's quite hard for anybody to hide from him, the speaker for Azeroth, so Magni is presumably able to track Rathian down and send us off to bring Rathian back. Now, this seems to lead into the datamine scenario where we go to save Rathian in the Karazhan crypts from Nazoth's agents. Now, according to the scenario's description, the Karazhan crypts is actually Rathian's hideout, so it's a pretty cool use of that area. Now, when you look at some of the data mined quest texts from Wowhead's livestream, it seems as if Rathian has been spending his time just working on how to, like, resist the old gods, resist corruption. And really, they could be getting dangerously close to a plot where Rathian basically is just our super-powered savior who knows how to deal with our problem, but fundamentally, some of this stuff would, like, it would line up with Rathian's goals as a character and some of his motivations. So, Rathian's father fell to corruption remarkably easy, and that means that it makes a lot of sense that Rathian will do all that he can in order to not repeat the sins of Deathwing. However, when it comes to kids trying too hard to not become their parents, well, the kids can often overcompensate and become exactly what they, well, don't want to be. Could Rathian's drive to be uncorruptible run the risk of him being corrupted? Perhaps it will, and if he gets close to being corrupted and it's all hanging on a knife's edge, maybe Anduin will be the one to save him. Now, sure, Tumblr would go utterly wild for it, but it would tie into WoW's past with the discussions between Rathian and Anduin during Mists of Pandaria. That would actually give Blizzard's writers an opportunity to show that Rathian's absolutist view can be quite incorrect and that um, Anduin's more empathetic one can actually work out and that that empathetic uh, sort of way of doing things could be the thing that would save Rathian, which would be an interesting way to develop those two characters. But anyway, the point is, Rathian's back, and just look at his new model. The guy's aged up pretty well. And what does this mean for the future of the game? Well, I think it means that the Dragon Isles are a lot more likely for Patch 8.3. Now, the existence of the Dragon Isles was confirmed earlier on in this expansion when one of Rathian's agents mentioned it. Now, combine that with the focus on the Dragonflight storyline that we've seen so far in Patch 8.2, and I think it's fairly clear that we're going to end up around the Dragon Isles at some point. So we could get the Dragon Isles as a new zone and then maybe Nihilotha as a raid. We could get both the Dragon Isles and Nihilotha as two zones, like with patch 8.2, or we could get the Dragon Isles and the faction conflict, being the core of 8.3, and maybe Nihilotha is something that Blizzard would save for a future expansion. Now, that being said, there is quest text of Rathian literally saying the real battle for Azeroth, so uh, that very well could be what patch 8.3 is. Maybe 8.3 is the death of Nazoth. Even though Ian was quite clear in saying that the final boss would be apparent to us after the 8.2 cinematic, well, looking at the game now, I think it's it's obvious that we're in a position where they could go in a few different directions, which is kind of exciting. Of course, that's not all the lore that we've got to talk about, though, today. Zakan, more commonly known as Zappy Boy, and uh, Valera both have new models, and the meaning of this is pretty darn clear. We are going to see a lot of the Horde Rebellion in patch 8.2.5. Now, that's hardly a surprise, but this does give us a bit more evidence.
moments. Now, Valera, she helped the Alliance communicate with Bane Bloodhoof, and of course was a longtime friend of, um, of Varian. And then, of course, for Zekan, well, we last saw him at the Swamp of Sorrows, all the way back during the patch 8.1 Starfine questline. And this could get super interesting. That questline ended with him returning to Orgrimmar, so, you know, he could, like, drum up support for Sarfang. But the thing is that his fate is totally unknown to players, because players could inform Sylvanas that um, Zakan betrayed her. Now, here's the thing. Thus far, every time there has been an option for the player to snitch to Sylvanas, regardless of the player's action, canonically, Sylvanas has found out about it. And that means that she knows about his loyalties. How could this plotline go? He could, you know, incite a riot, he could leave the city with his supporters, he could drum up a small army for Sarfang and co. Both of those things would work. Alternatively, things could go a lot darker. And I'd have you remember that this is the same Blizzard that started the expansion off with Teldrassil, and the same Blizzard who have enjoyed having Sylvanas raise people as undead and have them fight their friends, a Sylvanas that has taunted Sarfang about his son. Now, this would set the internet on fire, but I would not be surprised if they set it up so that Sylvanas tries to kill Sappy Boy in front of Sarfang. Now, given the old soldier cinematic and the parallels with Sarfang's son being very clear indeed, well, Blizzard would have a few options. They could have Sylvanas follow through, kill him, raise him up. That would devastate Sarfang. It would conjure up memories of his son. And in the process of doing that, they would make her an emotionally irredeemable character to the player base. Now, they could have Sylvanas try to do that, but have Sarfang stop her. He would be able to do for Zakan what he was not able to do for his own son. And that could be quite a powerful moment for the character. I mean, look, I know that's dramatic, perhaps I'm a bit cynical, but I do expect Blizzard to milk this character for all he's worth, especially given how they've talked about their Battle for Azeroth narrative decisions thus far, and their clear willingness to, you know, craft that big, shocking, emotional journey for players. They very much have talked about that out loud, it's not really a secret. And while we're on the topic of the Rebellion, well, a map has surfaced for a Baron's Warfront. This uh, would make complete narrative sense, but I admit I'm just not that interested in playing Warfronts. Maybe getting into a heroic one could change that. I do need to try that mode, but I just don't think it's worth the dev time. Now, I'm sure that Warfronts do get the engagement numbers when the gear is relevant, but I find it hard to imagine that people actually do Warfronts because they enjoy the content. That's not all, though, because Kalia Menethil now has her Lightforged Undead model. This is actually very exciting for lore nuts out there like me, given the significance of what type of being she is now. Many suspect that Kalia could end up being the leader of the undead after Sylvanas vacates her current position. She would be a horde leader that could easily mix in with the likes of Bane, and that certainly would be a change of pace for the Forsaken. And just character-wise, you know, being priests and all that, I could see her getting along with Bane. Now, there's far more that could happen here. We've seen what happened with Yurel's Lightforged Draenei, how they sort of turned a bit evil. We've seen how Zira maybe meant a bit well, but ended up being a bit of an authoritarian tool. Now, if these plot lines are to continue, then I think we can be quite sure that Kalia will be taking on a role here, given her status as a light-forged undead and all of the teasing about the light being a bit evil, sometimes, that we've seen recently. And then also, remember how the undead are seemingly more resistant to void corruption? Well, this could make her a particularly strong ally in the fight against the void. Overall, though, there's just so much potential with her plotline, and it's great to see Blizzard just, you know, that they're going to be continuing it, that they're putting attention and care into this character. Next, though, let's talk about the Worgen and Goblin revamp. This is a very long-awaited one, and honestly, there's not that much to say about it other than I think, yeah, they're really good. I, I like Blizzard's art. Issues with both races have been improved, and, uh, well, it's kind of sad to see them not go with the more dangerous and ferocious-looking female Worgen, uh, but the new version is, I suppose, a bit of an improvement, and, uh, I mean, hey, with the new Goblin rigs and animations, I'm pretty sure the road is paved for the Vulpara to be the Horde allied race of Patch 8.3, maybe along with the Mechanomes for the Alliance. But anyway, with this done, Blizzard have finally fulfilled their promise with the character revamps, and now I imagine they have freed up a decent chunk of their animation resources for working on future content. And then next up, we've got a bunch of new mounts, but most of them are not available through gameplay. So we do have the Honeyback Harvester, the Bee Mount, which of course is through gameplay. Then there's the Alabaster, Storm Talon, and Thundering. These are both listed as in-game shop mounts, and they're the mounts that come with the classic 15th Anniversary Collector's Edition. So, I mean, in effect, yes, that is two more Storm mounts. At the end of the day, this will continue at a higher frequency like we've seen in BFA, given just how much these things are a pillar of World of Warcraft's business model. That's not all, though. We also have a new 
camel mount that comes from the new recruiter friend and a new explorer's jungle hopper, which also is a mount that comes through recruiter friend. And then this patch also does add the obsidian world breaker mount that we've covered before, as well as the storm pike battle ram and the frost wolf snarler. And I'm sure this is going to conjure up the usual store mount debate. I think I've been very clear in the past. I dislike this as a business practice given the sub fee. I disagree with it in terms of reward design in making an MMORPG. And I've also pointed out that the very high effort mounts are typically the store ones, not the in-game ones. But it's also worth pointing out that the more I've looked into Final Fantasy XIV as much as it is praised, I mean, man, it's store-like mounts. It's really rough, that situation. They've went way harder into that than Blizzard have. And maybe that's Blizzard catching on and trying to double down on this and make more money. If anything, it does show you that we're in a world where MMOs are, you know, they're not getting 12 million subs anymore. And because of that, the real way to monetize is to monetize the people that you have with things like recruit a friend, store mounts, boosts, tokens. These things together, they could double, maybe even more, the average annual revenue per player. And that's going to be a major thing for companies like Blizz. And you know what? I'll probably do a big survey, see what all of the, you know, my habits are, your guys' habits are, and we can maybe try to work out what the actual revenue situation is like on a per subscriber basis. So let me know if you're interested in a future video that's a deep dive into all those numbers. And then next up, let's round things off with some very interesting tidbits. So we've got some new illusions uh, that look very cool for, you know, like the enchantment illusions. We've got ensembles for the dungeon set one armor. So maybe that's something we can earn from the 15th anniversary event. There is also a new title, Renowned Explorer, which happens to come with a cosmetic armor set. Now, I've long advocated for sets like this that are tied to content like that and like Lore Master and the Continents, so I think that's really nice to see. Then also, a lot of the anniversary event stuff has been datamined. Well, specifically the raid. So there's actually three raids. They're called Chromie's Memory, TBC, Wrath, and Cataclysm, and each one has three bosses. So we're going to face Kelthas, Lady Vash, Archimond, um, Helgen, Hi Hygen, Hygen, I think, um, Anubarak and the Lich King, then Chogal, Nefarian, and Ragnaros. And I was also very happy to see that these are listed as time-walking raids, and this suggests that Blizzard are not going to be using the LFR system like they did for the Molten Core event five years ago. And that Molten Core event, I mean, I did that, it was a bit messy. So overall, I think this could be a fantastic event, especially if these bosses are being brought back and their gameplay is actually retained by virtue of it being time-walking. If they can do that, then this really would be a strong celebratory anniversary event that I think would I mean, it would drive gameplay. You'd actually have a reason to subscribe that month, log in, and play that. It's not new content, but, I mean, you know, given all the circumstances, it will feel new, and I think it's just a really, really cool event. So between that and Alteric Valley, I'm really happy with what Blizzard are doing for that 15th anniversary event. But anyway, there you go. That's it for the news. There's been so much with uh, Patch 8.2.5 already. I'm holding off until we get more details until I, like, do the full lore deep dives on these topics. They are really interesting. Got a lot of ideas. If you've got any yourself, let me know down below. Uh, so so yeah, really cool. It's uh, just nice to see that the WoW like cycle is continuing. I mean, obviously it was never going to stop, but like the pace of development seems to be a little bit more back on track. Maybe the back half of Battle for Azeroth won't have the lulls in content and interest that characterized the first half of Battle for Azeroth. If that's the case, I'd certainly be happy. I think 8.2 has moved us in a good direction and 8.25 and 8.3 could continue to move us in that good direction. And uh, yeah, maybe Battle for Azeroth could end up in a far better place than it started. But there you go. That is it for this video. If you are interested in all of the uh, tasty paladin stuff, there we go. That's on our Patreon for this month. If you're interested in a writing position for our industry news channel, check out the link down below. And with that, thank you very much for watching this video, and I will see you next time.